everyone. It's really a nice day, and really get honor get uh, invited to be the MC of this panel. And I think we got 40 minutes. So my name is Ling. You can, oh, my name is Wu Xiao. You can call me Ling, which is my developer name. I'm the founder of ChainID, and also I co-organized Ethereum Riyadh, Ethereum Shanghai, and do a lot of Web3 e developer ecosystems. So now I think uh, let's go to the first questions. Uh, let's do a quick self introductions. Would you mind do a quick intro to tell us who you are and what you build? So I'll start Sarah. first. Hi guys, um, this is Sarah. Uh, I'm from BME Chain. I'm the APIC BD lay of uh, BME Chain. So I joined in this industry back to uh, six years ago. So mostly uh, working for ecosystem building for layer one uh, protocols or web three projects. So for now, my role in BME Chain is mo mostly about um, incubation projects, support developers, um, building partnerships with uh, big companies, um, et cetera. So uh, later, I will also share more about how we support BNB Chain projects. Thank you. Hello, guys. My name is Min Shi. I'm leading the strategy and research side of Asta Foundation. Before Asta, I was uh, at UC Berkeley studying electrical engineering and computer science, and then I joined Asta and four years ago. Yeah. And Asta, we are building one of the largest blockchain ecosystems in Japan, uh, focusing on bringing Web3 to billions, starting from consumer-centric applications. Right now, we have two major products. One is Asta Substrate, which is a substrate blockchain, one of the largest uh, Polkadot power chain built using substrate. And the other one is Asta ZKEVM, which is our new Ethereum layer 2 built using Polygon CDK. Yeah. Hello. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Emi Yoshikawa. I'm a VP of strategic initiatives at Repo. Uh, Repo is an enterprise crypto solution company based in San Francisco. And we were established in 2012, so we are definitely an old timer in this space. Um, there are two parts to our company. Uh, one part of our company is really focused on building enterprise crypto solutions. And we are particularly famous for uh, cross-border payment solutions. But we are much more than that. Um, we are also active in digital asset custody space and also tokenization. Uh, actually, just a few days ago, we announced our plan to uh, issue USD stablecoin. Um, so we are very excited about that. That's going to happen later this year. And then also, um, in the context of real world asset tokenization, uh, we participated in HKMA's um, EHKD uh, pilot program where we tokenized uh, real estate assets and use that as a collateral for um, home equity loan. So very excited to demonstrate the power of the blockchain in that use case. So that's one part of our company. And the other part of our company is really focused on building and expanding the ecosystem for XRP Ledger. Uh, XRP Ledger is a uh, L1 decentralized blockchain uh, that has been around for more than 10 years. And it's used by many different organizations, including REPL. We use that ledger for cross-border payments use case. Um, and then also, I'm really excited to, uh, we are really excited to partner with Hashkey uh, to help integrate XRP Ledger into their enterprise solutions, including uh, supply chain finance use cases and so on, and bring that to Japan with collaboration with SBI Holdings. So yeah, very excited to discuss more about XRP Ledger today. That was a very dramatic intro, especially with the music in the background, you know? I'm uh, Kenny. Um, I have to do my intro without music in the background, but I hope it's still exciting. I'm one of the co-founders of Manta Network. We are the uh, largest modular layer two. Oh, there it is. Drama. All right. Um, and we're home to over 200 different applications thriving in our ecosystem. And, you know, one of our focuses here, which is why I'm also really excited to be on stage talking about developer ecosystems, is, um, you know, we really take uh, pride in our ability to execute and help teams grow and flourish, not just as projects, not just as technologies, but as entire use cases and actual scalable companies, businesses. Hello everyone, my name is Shion and I'm the founder of Polito Labs. Polito Labs is currently building Hyperbridge, which uh, basically is a blockchain that acts as a co-processor for interoperability proofs. Um, previously to this, I was a core developer at Parity Technologies, where I worked on the Parity Ethereum project, the Polkadot network, and the Substrate framework. 
So it's really great to be here. Thank you guys for having me. Great, great. I see a lot of old friends such as BNB, Chen, iStar. I think we collaborate for years and I also see a lot of uh, new friends. So now let's go to the second question will be the introduction to Web3 infrastructure. So let's first have a quick discussion about Web3 infra based on your opinions. Uh, what are some effective strategies and uh, w what are the... Uh, wait a moment. Oh, let's have a discussion about Web3 Infra based on your understandings. Would you mind share your vision about Web3 Infra and the key components of Web3 in infrastructure? Um, I will start first. Okay. Um, I think the, the most key components of Web3 Infra development is a underlying uh, blockchain, which is layer one, layer two protocols. Um, and there's a lot of infrastructure that are building on top of it. So in terms of the visions that we have, it's more like by bringing a decentralized P2P network and also the programmable abilities through smart contract by the underlying infrastructures like layer one, layer twos. And also on top of it, we have different kind of tools like chain IDE, uh, those kind of developed tools and also different SDKs uh, and also data um, providers, indexers, scanners, etc. So there's a lot of infras on top of it and, and also in, uh, oracles, etc. So these tools is helping developers to build a really workable, uh, programmable depth on top of the uh, infrastructures. So for the infrastructures, the vision is more about building it to be more transparent, fair, decentralized for every developers and uh, potential applications. And for the infrastructure side, uh, it's more like make the development of those dApps or the developers to be easier and to be more like um, uh, you know efficient uh, to help them to to get. The, the, the real ap applications to build on top of there and to uh, really offer a product that is, can be really used by end users. So in a BNB chain ecosystem, a really robust and uh, comprehensive uh, tail, uh, developer tools uh, in France that's already been available on BNB chain calls, including wallet, especially AA solutions or social logins. There's a lot, I can maybe share more details about the interesting names and also like oracles, data infras, et cetera. So it's really ready to be used. So every potential interesting developers you wanted to build on top of BME chains, we can have a one-stop solutions to help you uh, by offering those infras uh, solutions to, to you guys, yeah. Yeah, similar to what Sarah just mentioned, from our point of view, definitely blockchain is one of the most important infrastructure in the Web3 area. But what we mean like blockchain here does not only refer to the chain itself, but also the necessary toolings, the development environment on top of that. Um, but from our perspective, for sure, for us public blockchain, our goal is to provide the developers us a wide variety of the infrastructure as possible. So to provide developers with more choices since different infrastructure have their different focuses. For example, in terms of bridge, we can see like there are bridges like Wormhole, they're all focusing more on the decentralization. There are also bridges like Orbiter, like Layer Swap, focusing more on the efficiency side. Yeah, that's also one of the reasons why we started Startail Labs. Uh, it's one of the developer companies behind Asta Network. Because when we were focusing in Japanese market, we noticed that a lot of Japanese enterprises, they have their special needs. They want low latency infrastructure and they care less about decentralization, etc. That's why we started Startail Labs to build infrastructure such as indexers, such as RPC endpoints, focusing on enterprise use cases. But on the Web3 native side, we are also working closely with those more decentralized, those who are exploring the frontier uh, of decentralization and efficiency, such as the graph, layer zero, piece, et cetera, for Web3 native uh, sites like oracles, bridges, indexers. Yeah. Yeah. So at Repo, uh, we believe the ultimate goal of Web3 is to really build a more equitable and more inclusive decentralized uh, economy where the resources are more optimally allocated and also stakeholder interests are better aligned. And in order to enable that, what's really critical as the foundation is uh, really the internet of value. 
And that's really our founding vision at REPL um, that we continue to believe in until today. And basically, Internet of Value is a world where the value moves just like information does today. And more specifically, there are three key components to it. Uh, first is the ability to tokenize anything of value in a hyper-efficient manner at a very low cost and also in a very, very secure way. And then the second is to, uh, once it's tokenized, to move those tokens uh, anywhere within the chain, but then also across the chain. So the interoperability here plays a very, very important role. And then the third is to, uh, to exchange those tokens at anywhere, and then also um, even like including the long tail assets as well at a very minimum cost. So those three things are super, super like fundamental. So uh, at, with the XRP ledger, we are actually addressing those uh, core primitives at the protocol layer rather than like at the um, uh, smart contract layer. So if you want to tokenize, say, like a smart uh, stable coin or NFT, you don't have to actually write a smart contract and deploy it. But rather, you can just use the protocol native capabilities by calling APIs and also using the standard uh, languages and so on. So yeah, at, at, with the XRP Ledger, it's really focused on those, like doing those three key components really, really well as a key infrastructure for Web3. Please. Um, I think everything on the infrastructure level architecturally is broken and doesn't work. Um, I think what we're doing right now is great in terms of experimentation, but it's not great in terms of productization. It's not great in terms of scalability and adoption. The reason is because, you know, if you look back in 2011, um, when Bitcoin started experiencing all these forks, right? You've got Litecoin, you've got Digibyte, and then later you've got Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Silver, all these different forks, right? Like when they came out, they were sort of what we would consider the pinnacle of technology. They were supposed to take some outdated technology, Bitcoin at the time, and make it so much better, right? But now we look into this, this past and all that innovation, all that time, money, resources spent amounts to kind of nothing, right? <laughs> and then the needs of the users have changed since that time. You go to 2016, right, with Ethereum, and then 2017 subsequently with Ethereum forks, and all of a sudden user needs are no longer about simply transfer of value peer-to-peer -peer payments. It's now about decentralized applications. Litecoin doesn't have Turing completeness. Digibyte doesn't have Turing completeness. None of those projects were able to pivot and continue to provide value to the users. They were too focused on innovation at the core level for a great technology that ultimately didn't have product market fit. Same with Ethereum and all the Ethereum forks, right? We now have, or we've seen the emergence of many Ethereum forks, many Ethereum competitors, all trying to innovate on the same core fundamental technologies that at the time all sounds so amazing, but looking back on it, you know, no one, no one successfully captured that market share. And even the remaining market share that there is, how many real users are there, right? Um, now we're in 2024, we're having the same issues, but we're looking at it from a scalability perspective. You've got L2s, you've got a bunch of L2s. I mean, we've got Astar, we've got Manta, Right on stage today, we got BNB chains. Um, obviously, not an L2, but you know, like at the same same core focus is on scalability. But the question is, where does this go? Right? We have all different approaches in order to build this, and the technology side is great. But the real question is, are you going to be able to adapt when the changing needs of the users inevitably come, and you have to address new problems? And I think for most of the L2s in this space, the answer is no. And so I'm kind of disappointed in that sense because you have all this amazing talent, you have all this amazing innovation, but we're so focused on building the technology and so focused on being so zealous about the infrastructure, which no other industry cares about, right? Like, you don't go into a cloud computing industry, deploy an iPhone app, and then people say, I'm not going to use yours because you're deployed on Google Cloud and I only use AWS, right? No one else cares about that. But for, for some reason, we're extremely fixated on that. And so 
the point I'm trying to make here is that there has to be a very different approach to architecture. And what is that approach? I think that approach is modularity. Modularity is not just a term that you use to like, you know, raise VC money. I think it's an entirely different architectural approach to building, deploying, and shipping at a much faster speed than you can do in-house, right? If you were to take all the components of building an airplane and do it yourself in-house, you're never going to outcompete someone like Boeing. You're never going to outcompete someone like Airbus because they buy their components, right? I mean, Boeing doesn't make their own engines; they buy Rolls-Royce engines. They don't make their—they don't even make their own seatbelts. They buy their seatbelts from OEMs, right? This is the modular approach to be able to continue to innovate and support and build for user needs as they continue to change, which I don't see us doing in the industry, but I think we should. Um, and so, yeah, modularity. I think that's the biggest thing to take away there. So my, uh, my opinion on the matter is actually going to harp off of what Kenny just said, and it's also the fundamental thesis uh, as to why we're building Hyperbridge. Um, let's start with basically the programmable application landscape. One of the most powerful things about this is that you can deploy a contract, and this contract can immediately leverage all of the other applications, all of the other contracts on this layer. This is immensely powerful, which means that you don't have to do everything, right? You can leverage Uniswap for swaps. You can leverage you know, existing lending protocols if you need to do some lending. You can do flash loans. These are things that occur because you can compose applications that are already existing on the single um, execution layer. But my problem is, and this is also what Kenny is saying, is that there's no innovation at the single layer, right? There's only so much uh, forks of Uniswap we can deploy onto new L2s uh, before we get tired of this. What we need to start looking at is basically how we can start to compose applications across chains and how we can build purpose-built chains and have and leverage them in such a way that the user doesn't have to care about where these applications are hosted. This is also something that I believe is the wrong mentality is that we're focusing on, oh, my application is built on this L2 or my application is built on that L1. The users fundamentally don't care. Users don't care if your application is built on AWS or GCP. Um, and this is why we believe that bridges, especially secure bridges, bridges that verify consensus, bridges that verify state proofs are going to be necessary for the next logical step of, of applications that are composed across different chains where users don't actually care where the applications are, they just care that some action is being performed and this action is being performed securely and I do not lose custody of my funds at any point of, of this interaction. And that's what I believe is the next step of, of uh, the entire crypto landscape is more interoperable applications, more modular applications and less chain focused applications. Great, great. Really appreciate all the opinions about the Web3 infra. So actually, it is really hard. I mean, I'm a coder. I start off year of nine, I start coding. And about seven or eight years ago, I start coding on Ethereum. So I mean, nowadays, all, all our panel uh, guest speakers, I think, are from Web3 infra. But actually, for the real builders, I mean, we code. And we're trying to build some products. And it is really hard. I mean, like. I remember that seven years ago when you code on Ethereum, the, like one year later, all the infras are not working. Even like the web3.js, everything is not compatible. I mean, uh, you, you need to modify a lot of stuff. You need to keep coding. You need to build in with your APIs. You need to update everything. So actually, for all the real builders, the, I think the mass adoptions, which is application, is really important. But it is really hard for the normal users to code on different blockchains because all the infras they raise so much money, but all these kind of applications, GameFi, DeFi, NFT, the small stuffs, they cannot raise so much money, and also they need to take care of all the tech stack. So that is the, imp I mean, really the challenge nowadays. A lot of builders are actually facing. Uh, so next step is I think we need to go to the developer ecosystems. Uh, from your point of view, how can developers be encouraged to participate in Web3 ecosystems, which is exactly how can we lead them to build some applications, how can we help them to onboard their, their applications, and what are some uh, effective strategies for onboarding developers on Web3 platforms? Maybe this time we can uh, start from Sean. Let's go to this cycle, yeah. <laughs> sure thing. So I, um, I have a very different perspective on, on this problem. Like I said, we are already in this cycle of constantly redeploying the same applications across you know, new L2s and new L1s as they pop up. I think what we need to do is to start innovating at the base layer. Um, frameworks like Cosmos SDK, Polkadot, and, and Substrate, they've created you know, um, 
basically infrastructure that makes it accessible to build blockchains, purposefully build blockchains at the base layer. So you can imagine we can now start to build more application-specific blockchains that are very performant, highly scalable, and are able to serve as a result a larger amount of users. They plug into bridge networks, and then these you know, blockchains are still interoperable with the rest of the ecosystem. They're not necessarily siloed to you know, their own chain. And I think that this is going to be effective at onboarding more, more developers because essentially now developers are no longer having to rely on infrastructure that can change, like you just said, underneath them. They essentially control the infrastructure. And I think this is very, very important that developers start to control the infrastructure. And this is now democratized across, across the industry. Okay, thank you. Kenny? Yeah, I think... Um, <clears throat> Another way to think about this, though, is that like, it's not about onboarding developers, right? Like, it's about onboarding teams. It's about onboarding products. It's about onboarding new ideas, innovators, right? Like, and and the developers, right? Like, they bring the raw talent. They bring the execution. But you know, you also need to have the vision. You also need to have the the team to actually scale, go to market, build an actual product, right? And so. I think, you know, when it comes to onboarding at Manta, we don't think of it as just like, you know, onboarding developers. We think about it as onboarding and making projects successful. Uh, and so the question is, you know, how do you do that? And surprisingly, the bar is extremely low. <laughs> like, you know, like I think across the industry right now, especially in the Ethereum space, there's this concept of credible neutrality. And credible neutrality is, you know, um, in layman's terms, you have this arena, and you throw every project into the arena, and you say, OK, you guys battle it out. And then whoever wins gets the lion's share of all the prizes, right? But we're not going to help anyone. And I, I think that's kind of the wrong way to look at it, because now all of a sudden, these projects, right, they, they do need help. They do need resources, right? And, and traditionally, resources have been in the form of grants. But I do think that grants are the wrong incentive here, because it just encourages this sort of mercenary type behavior. And so how do you kind of support these projects without necessarily just throwing money at the problem and calling it a day, right? And so I think like, you know, as an infrastructure project, you also have to act more on the service level side. And I think that's something that a lot of infrastructure projects don't think about nowadays. But when it comes to looking across to other industries, again, to cloud computing, for example, where infrastructure is a commodity, how do people differentiate themselves? How do companies differentiate themselves? They differentiate through enterprise level SLA, service level agreements, where they're able to provide a certain amount of service contractually obliged before you know you can you, before they get penalized, for example. Right? We don't see these in the, the the crypto space, right? All we see is technology, core technology, and we say good luck. But I think like on the infrastructure level, in order to really encourage projects to not just deploy, but flourish, right? You have to think of it from a service level as well. And so, um, yeah, service. Okay, I mean? So I think um, to answer this question, it's probably helpful to step back a little bit and then kind of look at the macro picture. So today in the world, there are about 29 million developers in the world across many different domains. How, what percentage of that do you think is actually um, developing, actively developing Web3 applications or in Web3? <laughs> Anyone want to guess? <laughs> Very few. <laughs> Very few. Very yes. Few. It's according to the latest uh, developer um, report by Electric Capital, uh, it's only less than 0.1%. Right? It's uh, monthly active developers is uh, only like 20,000 or so. So it's a very, very small part of the bigger kind of developer um, ecosystem. So our question should be not about like how to bring developers from another chain to my chain, uh, and then how, why our chain is better than the other chain, but it's more about like, how can we bring the next uh, million people into Web3, and how we can like, minimize and, uh, the friction for Web1 or Web2 developers to come into Web3. And uh, you know, one of the solutions we are kind of working on through XRP Ledger is to uh, basically our chain is uh, no smart, co smart contract model. So the developers don't need to learn a new language to build something. It's all core functionalities are all embedded at the protocol level. So you can just use like API calls uh, using like a JavaScript or Python that the very familiar languages. So that, that's just one example of how we reduce the 
uh, the barrier, but uh, there are many other things that we can do. Just uh, the key is to how can we make it just uh, not so like unique about uh, something that's unique about Web3 will become a kind of barrier for other developers coming. So that's something that we are we've been focused on right now. Great, Minshu. Yeah, how we see this question, we think like. For, as that we think flywheel is the key in terms of onboarding developers because in most business we can say like developers product users they all come together when you have more than great developers you get awesome products and when you have awesome products you get more users and those massive users they help to generate revenue for those developers for those products so right now web3 is still at a very early stage so from our perspective, we see the question more as how to bootstrap the ecosystem, how to start the flywheel of onboarding users, onboarding developers, onboarding great products. And the approach that Asta we are taking right now is that we start to focus more on onboarding, first onboarding specific products, consumer faced products that can help to eventually bring more users. And those massive users can eventually generate more revenue to attract more great developers. That's why in the Japanese market, we started to work with those like enterprise groups like Sony, Toyota, Mazda, because they face consumers. They face millions, billions of users who haven't touched Web3 yet. And those users are the goals that we are onboarding to Web3. And with those users, we get more developers. That's our perspective. Great, great. Sarah? Um, I think Kenny and uh, means, uh, means, it means she also both mentioned about users and the services that blockchain is uh, offering. I think that is a part that BNB Chain is really also really care about. So when we talk about developers, I think there's two types. One type is developers that is face having a short time goal. Um, so they are like, um, doing different projects on different chains, some some opportunity for them is more like having an opportunity to offer a new projects on a new chain and get users like double points or even triple points, and then they have a really successful coins to be issued within a short time. And another type is they think they have the demand from their inner inner heart, and they do think that blockchain is kind of changing the industries and can really offer a real use case and can really change um, something or make a difference. And that kind of developers will really think about how to build a long-term projects instead of a short-term coin. So for those developers, what BNB chain will attract them will be, firstly, we have a biggest user base. So for BSC, we have one million DAU, and for OPBM, we have another one million DAU. So OPBM is the layer two. So for this a big user basis, that can the biggest attract, uh, attract reasons or features to, uh, for us to onboard our developers to build the, their products on top of BNB chains, which means you're building there not because we are giving you money or developer su uh, uh, technical support or even marketing support, but more because there is some organic users that is uh, playing BNB chains or they have BNB tokens in their wallet. So just a really a easy way to help them to onboard the existing users or even by using the uh, AA wallet solutions, etc., to onboard the Web2 users. So that is the first um, approaches or or things that we use to sell BNB chains to developers. And the second thing is definitely the existing ecosystem. So the thing that we can help them to connect uh, ways or help them to grow their projects, not just the branding of BNB chain, but also there have already been a lot of like, existing projects building on top of BNB chains. We have over um, 5 billion TV, TVL on BNB smart chain, which means there's going to be a lot of DVLs, uh, liquidities, and assets. So if you are building a DeFi project on top of BNB chain, which means you have a higher opportunity to get more TVL or even trading volumes there. And also, we have you know over 5,000 uh, dApps that's already running on top of BNB chain mainnet, which means that you can work with a lot of uh, relevant projects or partners in BNB chain ecosystem. So if you are doing a AI projects, there's gonna be AI infras, AI tools, and even you know 
um, AI dApps, agent, uh, bot agent, marketplace, etc. You can work with, or you can strategically partner with. That is also a way that we attract developers, which means that you are not battle here for a single game, but you are doing it together with other ecosystem players. So that can make us to win together instead of just being a single hero in this ecosystem. So this is two um, key metrics or key features that we're selling our solutions to developers in this market. And besides that, there are some like you know. Uh, general services that we offer to developers, including builder grants, including even investment. Um, services like marketing, we have a lot of uh, media channels that can really help projects to promote their solutions and can really get them some really big tractions in their the communities. That is also a really uh, uh, powerful way that we help our uh, developers to build their products. So yeah, we have a lot of things we can offer. So if you are developers uh, interested in BME Chain, so come to me after the event. Uh, we can guide you through the whole packages that we have in our, our ecosystem. Thank you. I think Amy's point is really interesting. So how to transfer the Web 2 developers into Web 3 is a I mean, really good challenge. And we tried that for several years. So like I think five years ago, we go with BNB, go to Africa. We, we go across like 40 countries and teach them how to code with Binance Math Class. And also with A Stars, I think we just have the CKS boot camps. And I think we attract all the builders and we force them to do live coding. I mean, all the sponsors, if they want to talk, they need to do live coding because we do not want them to sell some product. We, we want them to teach people how to cut some real skills that they can survive. Because I travel so many countries and see so many developers in some countries, actually, I mean, they, they have no, no choice. If some, some place like in Lebanon, I mean, the first developer community, we, we have that in basement. I mean, there's no electricity. The government can only provide two hours of electricity. And all the developers there, they are trying to survive. So this is kind of, they have no choice, but they need to code and they need to try to catch the wave in Web3. So yeah, I mean, we try a lot, but actually the, the fact is that the real world doesn't care so much, even you do a lot of education, <laughs> even you do a lot of stuff. I mean, even in some boot camps, we only have five to six people. I mean, we do that for a hundred times and trying to attract some web, web two builders. Recently, the, the track is good, but I mean, in days before, we can only attract like 10 people, teach them how to code and try to encourage them to build something. It's really hard. So I think we have our last questions. Last question is how to build a global developer community. I mean, this one is interesting because different countries, they have different culture, they have different barriers. And what are the challenges in building global developer community for Web3? And how can language and culture barriers be addressed to foster inclusive the developer community? So maybe the last question, start from Sarah. Yeah, uh, first of all, for that, we work with uh, local uh, builder communities and accelerators to get us more close to the local developers. And also we have hired local people based in key regions, like for example, Japan maybe, and uh, South Korea, and some of the Europe uh, countries to get us um, a more comprehensive or more ready to support potential developers uh, in that region. So that is also an approach that we take. And also we do a lot of like education courses, like we work with you guys, um, to kind of like, offer a standardized uh, courses to teach them how to really build on top of BNB chain. So um, no matter where you're based, or no matter what kind of country, uh, languages you speak, uh, the courses is here and it's really easy to understand or to learn. Um, that is the third thing that we do. And in the future, we'll have more hackathons and more collaborations with accelerators in different regions to help us to really uh, build more close relationship with developers here and also giving them more opportunities to stand out with their own projects or even uh, simple ideas. Um, and we can um, you know, work out a way to really support them to build um, BNB chain ecosystem. That is the you know, simple answers from my side. Yeah, regarding localization, we have a lot of experience. Uh, because as many people may know, Asta has a huge community in Japan. And Japan is one of our most important regions for developer acquisition as well. 
And I would say first, language is definitely the largest barrier, especially in East Asian regions like China, like Japan, etc. Um, that's why we started Asa Japan Lab, and that we're working with a lot of like local developer communities, such as the village, for document translations, etc. And the second important thing we see is definitely developer community. Imagine if you are a student in university and you are just coding alone. You are the only Web3 guy in your class or something like that. It's very difficult for you to like to continue to building Web3, to continue learning Web3, to continue contribute to Web3. So regarding this, for example, we are hosting like regular monthly, weekly meetups in Tokyo, in some like uh, just some barbecue, uh, weekly barbecue. So like developers, they can gather together and they can uh, talk with each other. They can chat with each other. They can um, contribute to Web3 by maybe like forming a team there. That's a strategy we are, we are adopting right now. So basically fostering community uh, of developers and fostering that kind of Web3 culture. So, um, so blockchain technology is obviously uh, borderless technology, but when it comes to like a developer growth strategy, there's no like a one size fits all kind of strategy. So we always have to think about this from a kind of a global perspective in a sense think globally, but then act locally. So uh, whenever we reach uh, new markets, uh, we try to we find a very trustable partner who really understands the local market and understands the motivation of local developers and help translate our global strategy into more local context. So that, that part is a really key focus. Um, and then also on top of that, we believe that it's really important to engage with uh, students around the world. So we leverage, we actually have a uh, university blockchain research initiative, uh, and we work with more than 50 universities around the world, and many of them have uh, engineering schools, and we provide a campus ambassador program to basically appoint uh, students who are passionate about XRP Ledger, and then that student becomes a kind of a student hub to bring uh, reach out to other students and then do meetups and workshop and all those things. So I think those um, really localized approach uh, uh, goes a long way. Uh, and then also just speaking of an uh, inclusive uh, developer network, making sure that there are many female like Web3 developers is going to be really important. And then it's important to address this problem before things get too late. Uh, today, there are only 5% uh, of uh, represented by female in the Web3 developers. And it's a really, really serious <laughs> problem right now. And again, we also leverage this university network to help educate and make sure that our female engineers are interested in blockchain and have the opportunity to participate in like a workshop and the hackathon so that uh, we can start building the pipeline of female developers as well. So it's not just like a local culture, but then, but also gender diversity. I think all those those kind of uh, diversity is really important. Can you? Uh, yeah. So um, on the micro level, right? What Manta is doing, kind of all the above that people have already mentioned. I think another key point here is that. You know, if you guys are running your own infrastructure projects and trying to build ecosystem, it's extremely important that this is a priority not just for the team but for the founders, right? And so, uh, for us, right, we also you know have these regional people. But every single day, uh, me and the other founders, we sit together with these regional team members and we understand exactly what the problems they're facing on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And what we can do to help because there's nothing that there's no one above the founders in terms of unblocking things. So if even the founders can't do it, then it's probably not a problem that can be solved, right? So it just it just makes the whole sort of process of developer onboarding a lot faster because the agility is there, right? There's no red tape, there's no bureaucracy. Let's just get it done. Um, on a macro level, how do you onboard developers, right? I think, again, Emmy's point earlier about, hey, there's 0.1% of the total population of developers that are building on uh, blockchain. Why? I think because the incentives are really messed up. I think because you know people that want to build cool projects are not as encouraged as people who want to build you know um, these these sort of current trendy things, right? If if you've got AI, if you've got 
ZK, if you've got all these other things and you've got airdrops and a point system, bam, you're golden, right? Doesn't matter what you deploy. That's not the right mentality, you know? And I think that um, until we can kind of get ourselves out of this sort of trend following mentality as an industry, then you know, it's gonna be an uphill battle to capture more than that 0.1% of developers. And so, you know, we can focus on this small pond and we can be as big of a fish as we want, but at the end of the day, it's just the pond, right? My opinions on how you can drive developer ecosystems is something that's also not been mentioned here, but is investments. Um, let's look at Silicon Valley, for instance. There's a reason there's a lot of developers flock to Silicon Valley it's just because of the capital that's available. Um, let's also look at the Polygon ecosystem and what you know Sandeep has been able to do. Sandeep basically is an angel investor in a lot of the Polygon projects uh, that are launching on Polygon. So investments drive developers and you know people are going to want to make money. This is something that they need to survive. Um, grants aren't going to cut it. Um, people need to see that their ideas are going to get funded and they can make a living off of building products for the Web3 space. Um, and they can't really do that if they don't have you know, a runway to, to build out these products because you have to understand building Web3 products is the hardest thing you can do. Facts. This is, you know, it's not, it's very different from Web2 where you could just put together a web the front end, you integrate with Firebase, integrate with Stripe, and boom, you can just sell a product and, you know, put it on Product Hunt. You have to do audits. These things cost money. You can't just tell people to just put their money in your contract and it's unaudited. No one's going to do that. Um, so there's a high capital requirement to deploying Web3 apps, and the investment needs to also match these high capital requirements uh, to be able to, you know, build ecosystems all over the world. So that's just my own opinion. Thank you, thank you. This is a small panel, but I hope you all get insights from all the expertise. Thank you. Have a good day.